Good evening, everyone. Um, because the lifts are broken in the back, um, any late joiners will be rather embarrassingly for them, having to walk right through. So um, um, as it's a fairly relaxed panel tonight, we'll, we'll um, let them wander in. So if you've got any spare seats, do direct people that come in as you go along. Um, my name is Sarah Peretta. I'm the UK Financial Capability Director for the Money Advice Service. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I have someone called David Marchbanks, who joined my team quite recently from Relate Charity. Um, so he is the link between these organisations and the reason for this event tonight, which is fantastic. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing this this week is um, you may have seen a bit of news coverage today about Talk Money Week. Um, so Talk Money Week is a national week um, where we're asking all sorts of organisations across the UK to open up conversations about money. Um, we have over 400 events happening this week. Um, not all run by the Money Advice Service, thankfully, or we really would be run ragged, but 400 events all by different organisations um, across the financial capability sector, um, large and small employers in the UK, um, the debt sector, etc., etc. So lots going on this week, and this is um, a key event for us on that calendar. Um, and we're also doing um, releasing a big news story each day this week as well. And today's one was about debt and hidden debt, and part of that was looking at how... Um, 29% of people keep their debt hidden from their partner, according to polling that we did for the release today. So very relevant content for this event. Um, the background to this event is work that both Relate and the CISI have done examining the link between relationships and finances. Um, and according to Relate, money is the number one trigger of arguments for couples. Um, and any of us that are in relationships can probably relate to that. Um, and while more than a quarter of couples questioned in um, the Relate research, It Takes Two, um, report from March 2017, say financial worries put their relationship under pressure. Um, CISI, CISI have also um, done some work around relationships and featured an article recently about clash, called Clashing Couples, about how financial planners can help couples who have conflicting approaches to managing money. Um, in the financial capability sector, where I've spent the last eight years or so. Um, there's been a wealth of research on debt and um, this sometimes touches on relationships and obviously the wider financial capability issues sometimes touch on relationships um, and more on that a little bit later about how there is definitely more opportunities to, to cross-reference between the two sectors. Um, and to date there's been little interaction between these two sectors. I was really encouraged tonight actually to see the name badges laid out on the table and see that I only knew one or two names on there, whereas when, when I go along to financial capability events, I know pretty much every name on there. And that's fantastic, because that really means that we're, we're already, through this event tonight, sharing learning across the, the various sectors. Um, so this is an opportunity to collaborate, as I mentioned. Um, tonight's event, for tonight's event, we're bringing together financial advice and planning sector, the relationship support sector, the general money guidance and financial capability sector, and we'll be exploring how relationship dynamics can affect money management, um, and what money management may mean in the context of a couple rather than just an individual. Um, lessons from practice and research on both sides of this issue, and we have two professors joining us from two different camps, which will be really fascinating. Um, and then also opportunities for collaboration to develop better information, guidance and support for consumers to help couples and families talk money and um, manage money together. <laughs> so... We have an expert panel, and I've got bios for all of them, which they've all edited at the very last second with a big crossing out of all their various achievements. All of them said, oh, gosh, don't go on and on about me. So this might get a bit messy because I'm trying to read a very heavily edited copy. Um, but suffice to say, there are acres of experience that they have crossed out. Um, so this is a very, very experienced panel. So um, we have Marlene... Outrim, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your surname before I started, big mistake. Um, she is a certified financial planner and fellow of the CISA. I, um, her first career was actually as a probation officer and she's had 13 years experience in counselling and therapeutic skills. Um, and she recognised the need for a more family focused approach and set up Unique Family Wealth, which helps families, individuals and family businesses cascade wealth seamlessly from one generation to another with their own personal financial plan. Uh, we also have June Brogan, who is a relationship couples counsellor and family counsellor. She's also an area manager for late services in West, East and Mid Kent. She has five children and is passionate about strengthening people's relationships and teaching young people to identify what a healthy relationship is. A master's in relationship ther therapy sparked a career in helping families and couples to strengthen their relationships in the knowledge that strong relationships build a happier and more secure society. Um, next, we have Sharon Collard 
And Sharon and I have been on two panels in two weeks together. Um, and I've known Sharon for a long time. Um, she is one of the leading experts in the financial capability sector. She's a research director at the <coughs> University of Bristol's Personal Finance Research Centre. Um, the centre specialises in social research on personal finance, finance topics. Um, their current research includes a programme of work on consumers in vulnerable situations and some really important work, which is gathering prominence, I think, looking at the poverty premiums paid by low-income households. Sharon is also a member of the Financial Services Consumer Panel, um, an independent statutory body that represents the interest of consumers in the development of policy for the regulation of financial services, and a council member of the Pensions Policy Institute. And last but not least is Professor Jan Walker, OBE. She's Emeritus Professor of Family Policy at Newcastle University. Um, she's trained and practised as, as a probation officer, family therapist and family mediator. Uh, she's directed over 50 research studies and published widely on marriage and divorce, family mediation, marital counselling, family communication, post-divorce parenting, domestic violence, crime and policing. And presumably a lot more with a list of 50 to go through. Um, between 1985 and 2005, she was director of Newcastle's Centre for Family Studies. Um, she has also served on an entire list, which has been scribbled out, of various public appointments. Um, she's a member of Relate's Policy and Research Advisory Group and she became a Relate trustee in 2011 and is vice chair of the Relate board. Um, so, in terms of the format of this evening, I have a series of questions that I'll direct to the panellists, um, but we really want lots of interaction from you. So, um, at various points during the evening, I'll, I'll you know, put your hand up and we'll... We won't have a formal area for questions, so after, during each question, um, we'll give an opportunity for you to ask questions of us. Um, and I have, as I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about relationships, despite having spent a lot of time thinking about financial capability, I'm hoping to learn some things myself about what I can put in practice at home for a harmonious rest of my marriage. Um, <laughs> it's been okay so far, just for the record. <laughs> 11 years, it's not been a problem. Okay, so, um, turning to our first question... Uh, so, no, not turning to our first question. I just cut you all off. Um, so I'm giving each of the panellists an opportunity to introduce themselves and some initial thoughts before I turn to the questions. Okay, Over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, as you probably know, Relate are specialists in relationship counselling. And we believe that healthy relationships are the basis of a strong and happy society. So I wanted to just talk about some of the things that we that happen in the counselling room because every day um, couples counsellors all over the country that work for Relate are facing the unknown and not knowing what the level of conflict is going to be when people sit down in front of them. It's an amazing privilege to be a Relate counsellor but it's also incredibly challenging and um, demanding and exhausting at times. So... Money is one of the top subjects that causes conflict in couples and family relationships. And so when we listen to the, to the clients in front of us, we're trying to establish what the problem, what is causing the problem. Because people in couples go on having the same argument often for 20 or 30 years. But what we're trying to establish in the counselling room is what is the cause of that. So one of the first things we're looking at, if we're seeing conflict, say, over finances, is what, where are these differences coming from? Why do they see money in such a different way? So we start to explore the family of origin, and we look at what happened, um, what their experience was of money in their family of origin. And it's amazing how two people who look, who look like they've come from a similar background can have such a different experience of, of dealing with money. You know, they could be, even in two households where they both had plenty of money, there can still be a very different approach to how you deal with money. So we look to uncover what the, what the um, differences are, and, and we look at cultural differences, um, um, could be social differences, and, and then we start to listen to what, how each person feels about money and what it represents to them. Because for some people money represents failure or success, and to some people it, it represents safety and security. So we need to establish what their driving factors are. Um, and some people, therefore, are searching for a real safe certainty, which is a place that they're never going to find, um, especially not at the moment with Brexit. But um, we try and help them to find a place of safe uncertainty, um, which 
I'm sure you financial guys know a lot more about than I do. Um, so we then observe often that there are power struggles within the relationship. And sometimes we see that one person has either taken or been given the responsibility over finances. And it's quite important to differentiate that. Um, often couples use money as a currency. And it's a sort of part of the many things in coupledom that gets withdrawn or controlled, the same as money and sex and love. Um, all these things, you know, are a currency within a relationship. We look at um, how independent each person is or how dependent they appear to be. And we um, hear people feeling sometimes more that regardless of how much money they have, that they feel more um, wealthy when they're in control of the finances. It's quite an interesting one. Um, so what does debt represent? Um, for us, for the counsellors amongst us, uh, you know, sometimes it is it's linked with other sort of, with, with sort of addictions in that it can be sort of an emotional hole that they're trying to fill. Um, so that needs exploring. And the other, of course, big question um, that we might want to explore is, is does debt cause conflict or does conflict cause debt? And so there's lots of interesting thoughts, I'm sure, in the room about that as well. So that's just my short introduction. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sharon. I think June's done, done the most fantastic job of um, kind of also describing what's in the evidence <laughs> base. So <laughs> that's a lot of... I mean, there's, um, I'm just going to think a bit about what we know from <clears throat> social research around these issues of money and relationships. And as June articulated, there's some really rich insights into um, the, the very complex interactions and emotions and relationships um, within couples, but also within families. Um, and that's, that's quite difficult to capture in research, so it mainly it's captured in in-depth qualitative research. Um, we have less information in terms of what we as a nation do. So, as you can imagine, some of those things are quite difficult to capture in official statistics or surveys, but it does mean that we have a bit of a visibility gap in terms of, you know, what, what as a population, what is our relationship with money within, within couples and within, within families. One of the other things that also <coughs> comes through from the, from the research is actually sometimes in research around money and relationships, it has been very focused on gender issues and gender power and imbalances and in inequalities within um, households and families. But actually, there's a bit of a recognition that perhaps um, the voices of men are sometimes lacking in that debate. Um, and also the voices of children and young people as being you know, parties within the family who are so um, seriously impacted by some of the issues that June talked about, such as debt. So I think those are some, some of the issues from research. The other thing that, that is lacking, I think, in, in the research um, field is uh, what about the emotional labour of managing money and managing debt? So there is something really important about having to manage emotions and feelings when you're dealing with money and you can imagine that when you're dealing with debt those things really come to the fore it's a time of enormous stress um, and, and there's a, and, and there's so there's emotional labor and there's practical labor about managing money in the household and who takes that burden and who feels that burden I think is a question um, that we need to know more about just to finish by saying I think there's a couple of really important contextual factors um, it's a really interesting time to be having this debate, I think, because we have the increasing uh, you know, digital money within our lives and technology um, in relation to how we spend money, how we manage money. And I think those things mean that on the one hand, actually, money can be much more visible to us because we have you know, much more access to our bank accounts. Uh, if we've got access to a smartphone, for example, uh, it's much more easy to check what we have, but it's also much easier to hide what we're spending. Um, perhaps if you know somebody with a gambling problem or a spending problem, actually spending is much quicker, much easier, and perhaps less traceable than it has been in the past. Um, I think also there's the issue about we're talking about you know understanding finance in, in relationships and in families. What constitutes a family nowadays? We have blended families, um, so 
in the UK, I think um, step families um, comprise about 11% of all couples um, with dependent children. Uh, so in the UK, that's about 660,000 step families that we have. And that brings its own complexity, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, across the evening, in terms of you know, obligations, responsibilities, feelings, um, and tensions between both within the family and across different families. So I think that, that's just some of the thoughts from, from research and the research base, and look forward to debating some of those issues. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. As a financial planner, I come from a, a different um, viewpoint. Um, for 13 years, I worked as a probation officer and specialised in divorce court welfare, so dealing mainly with conflicting couples over money, over relationships and their children. Um, so when I moved and made the transition to financial services, I thought there was nothing further that I'd, uh, I'd be dealing with in terms of those kinds of relationships. I was dealing with money. And it was only um, after a few years that I realised that the skills that I had acquired as a probation officer were very necessary in dealing with uh, money problems and money issues. Although the difference is that a lot of the people I deal with are not in debt, they have plenty of wealth, but even if you have plenty of wealth, financial advisors here know that that can cause many problems, just as many problems as if you don't have money. One of the issues, I think, in financial services is that many financial advisors are not really equipped to deal with these kind of issues. And I know where advisors have recognised this. They have taken on uh, uh, coaches, behavioural coaches, to deal with these uh, actual issues, to take them to one side and treat them as a separate matter so that they can then come back and deal with the numbers. Um, it's not always easy for somebody who's not got the expertise to pick up the signals that there is this kind of conflict. Who makes the decisions? Although one may be the most articulate and uh, knowledgeable about money, it could be the silent partner who actually, when they get back to the home, makes the decisions about their, their money issues. <laughs> And that's something that uh, you, know, you cannot always uh, pick up. So training in financial services um, is, is now including lots of social skills because they're recognising this is very, very important. But I don't think it necessarily deals with the implications and the behavioural issues of relationships and money. And I think this is something that I would really welcome in working in partnership with the other uh, parties so that we could deal with this, because I think it's um, a real issue um, that we can be uh, working with. Thank you very much. OK, my turn. And uh, I could start by saying, well, this panel just demonstrates to us all how important it is for both sectors to be working closely together. So good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to join you this evening. I'm going to just spend a few minutes throwing out a few bits of research evidence and a few bit, few stats, which I won't bore you with, but a few stats which I think are quite critical in understanding how relationships and money um, come together or don't. And I've spent most of my research life actually researching marriage and family breakdown. And when you do that, you come across uh, the, you understand what it is that causes the stresses and strains that actually make it impossible for people to go on living together. And uh, recently, um, Relate did a piece of research, which David Marchbanks was critical in, called uh, In Too Deep. I would recommend you look at the Relate website and read it. It is about the uh, investigation into debt and relationships. And I think that this most recent piece of UK research, and a lot of the research is American, and a lot of the findings are similar all over the world, but it's good to have our own research. More than a third of uh, debt charity clients and Relate Service users reported that debt had had a considerable impact on their relationship in a negative way. One in ten people argued with their partner about money at least once a fortnight. And one in ten people said they'd experienced a relationship breakdown due at least in part to <coughs> debt. And we know that debt is one of those issues where it can accumulate, it's unsustainable, it goes on. It's one of the most difficult issues for couples to actually talk about. And the other thing that this uh, piece of work 
really <coughs> uncovered, and it's been mentioned in passing tonight, is the amount of hidden debt. So uh, a lot of people saying, almost half of debt advice clients saying that they have hidden debt from their partner. They don't talk about it. It's a very difficult thing to talk about. And it was quite interesting in a survey of 2,000 UK adults in 2015, 45% of those adults, <coughs> they were in relationships, admitted that they were not always honest with their partner about the financial situation. And 18% said that they had actually lied to their partner about their earnings and a quarter about, about their spending. And certainly when you start looking at um, how people manage relationship <coughs> breakdown, quite often the differences in understanding of money matters comes out to the full and can be a cause of huge conflict. Debt itself is a huge stressor, but it's not just about debt. And as you said at the very beginning, um, conflicts about money tend to be the most dominant conflict in relationships. I would add that very quickly it's followed by arguments about household tasks and who should do them and who hasn't done them. So it comes quite close to the money arguments. But we know that one of the critical things in understanding relationship dynamics is not just the fact that there's conflict about money, but how people resolve that conflict. So how people manage to find a way through the difficulties they face. And people who are problem solvers, who have a lot of respect in their relationship, can work together on issues, are going to find it much more easy to actually work on the financial difficulties that they face. And I think that managing finances together is just about the same as managing other aspects of a relationship. And one of the things I think it would be dangerous to do is to say that financial issues are somehow different to other issues in a relationship. They're not, but they are, they are the cause of perhaps the biggest conflicts when people have different approaches, different understandings, and different emotional responses to the, to the whole issues of finance, as we've heard. But one of the other very interesting research findings, which we might want to consider later, is that managing finances together is a good indication of higher satisfaction in relationships. And there's been interesting research in the States which shows that couples who have joint bank accounts, for example, joint financial holdings, yeah. joint approaches to, to money, have more satisfying relationship as a couple than those who see, have everything done separately in their, in their families. I pointed this out to my husband when it came up and uh, was very pleased to say that we have managed finances jointly for 50 odd years, so it clearly is working. But uh, I think it's an important message that we need to think about how couples deal with conflict, deal with difficulties in their relationships, because we know that the most important factor for children growing up in households today is the quality of the communication in that family. And children who live with conflict do far worse on just about every uh, predictor uh, than children who grow up in homes without excessive conflict. We all face conflict, we all face difficulties, everybody get, has arguments at some stage, at some time. How we deal with them, how we address them, how we work through them is very important. And to do that, communication skills are really quite essential. And in that sense, I think the two sectors can work closely together. Okay. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so reflecting on all what you've said, and I might um, start by asking Marlene, actually, this one. What do practitioners need to be mindful of when discussing finances with a couple, and how can you deal with sensitive issues and disagreements over money? Well, I think one of the important things that uh, financial advisors need to do is get both couples involved, because often one person will come along and say, I want to deal with the finances. And it's easy to deal with that person if they have the knowledge and the, the experience. And they should always encourage the other person to, to be in the interview. Mm -hmm. And I just want to sort of um, refer to the comments about joint finances. As financial advisors, we're often encouraging couples to have separate accounts because of the tax position. Um, and it's not about joint finances, it's about being open and transparent with each other. 
And yeah. so the six-step process that we employ as financial planners um, encourages both couples to be in. They have to uh, complete a very comprehensive expenditure questionnaire. So they have to divulge what they spend their money on. And you, you have to approach that sensitively. Um, so I make a joke about, you know, well, maybe don't look at what she's spending, you know, you're spending on clothing and footwear. You know, and, and when I get them back, I will often challenge the figures and say, do you really only spend that? Or, and just so that we can, we can bring it out, because it's, then you start to see if, if there are any real issues, if there are any problems, and somebody is um, hiding in information. So that, that's one thing. And it is, this six-step process encourages couples to look at everything they've got, whether it's jointly or independently. And so if anything happens to one of them, they know exactly what their finances are. They know exactly what they've got and where it is. And that's the most important thing, I think, for financial advisors, is encouraging both parties to come along and to be open and transparent in the, in the whole process. Jane, from the council's perspective, your reflections on that question? Yeah, I think um, I think the important thing is to, as as you said, to get both people involved in the conversation, and you know, particularly the quieter one, and to just sort of try and ascertain, you know, because obviously, worst case scenario it could be some coercive control going on, <laughs> which we're very keen to uncover as early as possible. Um, but, you know, sometimes somebody's just quiet because they're not interested in the financial aspect or because they've, you know, historically got used to letting their partner to make the decisions or, you know, maybe that person's more skilled. But I think it's very important to ask, to have a set of questions, as you say, to, to ask, you know, from a safety point of view, are both people happy with what's being discussed? Um, sometimes you, you might find that they're at different stages, you know, one... One is thinking about being ready to do whatever process you're you're asking them, you're taking them through, but one is is sort of hasn't even started thinking about that. So it's ascertaining where they're both at and trying to get them in the same place, and and as you say, making it all very transparent. And what do you do when you face conflict where you where people are on completely different pages about money? Yeah, well, it depends how bad the conflict is. I mean, if it's really bad, then you would have separate sessions with them, so that you so that you can explore what's really going on. And particularly if somebody's really quiet, and if your gut's telling you, and you know this could apply to anyone in the room, if your gut's telling you that something's not quite right, it probably would be wise to speak to them separately, mm. or to refer them to counselling to, to you know bring out whatever's going on. Sometimes you've just got to bide your time because I'm dealing with a couple at the moment, and it's the wife who's come in. It's the second marriage, and there are two sons from the different marriages. Um, she is concerned about the inheritance tax situation and how the money's going to cascade down to the next generation. He doesn't want to come in. He doesn't believe that in financial coaching of any sort, so he, he doesn't want So she's thinking of all sorts of different ways to get him to come in to see me, and whether that's to complete his will or his lasting power of attorney. But in some ways, she believes once he's through the door, mm. she, he, may, he may engage with the whole process. But until that happens, and, and often that occurs, and you've just got to bide your time and keep encouraging the other partner to come in. But you can't force it. That's the problem. No. Okay, interesting. Any other reflections from the I suppose, that, I suppose the thing I would say is that when people are, what people are arguing about may be uh, less important than the fact that they are having a conflict about something. And what we know from research about arguments about money, it's very often a cover for arguments and difficulties in the relationship mm -hmm. because it's easier to surface difficulties about money than it is, for example, to surface difficulties about sexual problems or whatever. So money can become a cover subject for other things in a relationship which are really not functioning. And so it, it's kind of an easier thing to deal with. So I think it's always important to look for what are the underlying relationship dynamics, what else might be going on that is causing difficulty, because very rarely will it be just money. Mm -hmm. Great. And reflecting on, you, you mentioned a little bit, I think one of you mentioned in your intro about power imbalances. Um, and it would just be interesting to hear a bit more on your reflections of dealing with power imbalances, specifically about money, and then how that relates to other imbalances in power um, in relationships. Me? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's in relationships, there's there's sometimes can be multi power imbalances going on. I mean, sometimes it can be quite healthy in that somebody's taken the lead in one part of their lives and, and mm. somebody else is taking the lead in another part. But um, if you're noticing, I suppose, if you're in the room with a couple um, and you're noticing that you're getting quite a good conversation going with one um, and the other person isn't isn't sort of engaging, as I said before, you know, it, it's, a, it's something to explore. Um, but I suppose... It's easier for us as counsellors to explore something that could be um, quite dangerous. You know, for you guys, it's going to be t to when when do you not explore it as well? Because you could be opening something that's huge. You know, when is it best to refer that couple to relate or you know to somewhere else um, rather than opening what could be you know if it, if it is a domestic abuse situation, if it is if coercive control is going on, it it, it could be. Um, it could be a difficult situation to uncover. Um, the other thing to be aware of, I think, because there's not just the power imbalance going on between the couple, there's also the power imbalance going on potentially between yourself and one of the, one of the couple. Because, you know, if you're feeling quite like-minded, sort of same way of thinking with one member of the couple and then the other person's being left out, you're setting up a whole different set of power imbalances. So it's important to make sure that you are in a neutral place and that you are being curious with both of them, not not sort of bonding with one and then both attacking the, the other person. Um, so it's trying to stay neutral, really. I think in, in your field and in, in our field, it's, it's about trying to stay neutral in the room. Marlene, do you have any thoughts I, on I that? I think that's absolutely crucial because you, it's easy to um, give attention to the person who's most articulate. Um, and, and not pay attention to the other person who's quiet. Mm. And it could be quite possible that, that could, the quiet person is actually the decision maker. They go home and they have a discussion and that person actually makes the dis or influences um, uh, the decision. Um, but, it, but it's easy to do if you are not skilled in you know, picking up the nonverbal communication. So it's essential that you include the other person and you get them to engage and get them to talk about uh, the way they feel about their finances and what their thoughts are. And uh, it's difficult because, you know, most financial advisors just want to talk about the numbers and the money and uh, they don't want to go down the path of discussing something that may bring conflict yeah. or possible conflict. And, uh, and I can understand that because people will shy away from something that they're not used to or equipped to deal with. And in your experience, is, is power linked to earnings? Well, I was just going to say that, yes. Often power is linked to earnings. And I'm seeing far more women now who are actually earning better money and have got better pension benefits who are having a bigger say about the finances than I did quite a few years ago, where, where you know, always, nearly always the woman had very mm -hmm. little pension benefits. Um, we were always trying to sort of bring that balance uh, so that they could have some financial independence, especially if they came from a traditional background where the woman gave up work to look after the family. Um, but I'm certainly seeing far more independent women because they have their own the money. Mm. Fantastic. So any thoughts or comments from the floor from a practitioner perspective? Hand shooting up. Mm. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name, June. Right. You hinted about the backgrounds of people and couples, even though they may have money, they may not address money in the same manner. How far back do you go um, in terms of, as children, I'll speak for myself and maybe I may show my age a bit. Um, my parents didn't talk about money. I go to school, we had a, our own little bank at the school. We put away our little bit of money, but nobody else spoke about money. You go to work, you're not supposed to disclose to your colleagues or anything, anything about money. But yet still, you get into a relationship and you're expected to talk money. There's, you've got this run up to the end game, which is you hit a relationship with someone and you've got to talk about how do you pay for the house? How do you pay for the bills? Da -da 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 -da, and, and the like but nobody talks about money. So how do we create the conversation about money in the first place so that it doesn't go back to now we've got a conflict about money? It's a 
very topical question yeah, this week. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. I think um, getting people to talk about things is, you know, the number one way of, of building good relationships. So whether it be about money or schooling or sex or any any of the subjects that couples have to manage between them it's about exploring their family of origin and going back one or two generations and we do genograms and we you know we talk about great grandfather john who you know worked in whatever and he you know what his life was like and and, and we explore with them what was love like when you remember grandparents you know what was love like and what what did you what was um, what was their relationship with conflict you know and did people talk about money were you aware of money so we go back and we talk about what it was like for parents and grandparents and we build a picture and it's really important for the other member of the couple to see this because if it, it, you know they may not have said this out loud they may have mentioned granddad John who used to blah 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 but actually one member of the couple talking about their background and the other person listening to it in itself is enough to break down some of the barriers. And you are starting a conversation then, whether it be about money, sex, work, conflict, whatever. We compare, in the Relate Counselling Room, we compare both, both genograms, and we look at the differences between them. And, we, and just by hearing the other side, it, it does a lot to break down the, ba the, the barriers. I was just going to say as well, I think it's, it's such an excellent question and work that the Money Advice Service has been doing around um, looking at interventions that actually help parents become better money role models for their children uh, do show that actually some of those interventions, so they're kind of um, uh, seminars and sessions where parents come together to kind of talk about money and, and think about how they manage money and sometimes children take part in those sessions as well and they have been shown to actually help parents to have money conversations and to involve their children in things like uh, shopping and decisions and understanding the value of money. So I think there is some evidence there that actually, yes, we do need to improve um, how we talk about money from a very early age, and there's some good evidence about how that might happen. Um, so, and, and just, I think on the power issue, you know, at the, at the hard end, what surviving economic abuse and new charity looking at that particular issue estimates that about one in five uh, people will have had uh, some experience of financial abuse either at the hands of a present or a former partner so we're, we're talking about not insignificant numbers of people who mm. who experience those imbalances mm. in power mm. emotionally which are um, financially completely interlinked mm. interesting, interesting. Jan, you're nodding. Yeah, I'm just going to pick up on that actually because uh, Relate did a survey and uh, there's, it found that 41% of people um, had experienced at least one aspect of financial abuse in their relationship. 17% uh, had experienced a partner withholding money from them and 10% experiencing a partner controlling access to income, benefits, and so on. And another study which looked at a benefit families found that women typically on benefits often had no access to their own money. So, and that is classed as a form of financial mm -hmm. abuse. It's using power to withhold money. And the behavior consequence of that in this piece of research showed that women tended to go without to prioritise their partner's needs and their children's needs and to go without themselves because they didn't have access to money and it was controlled for them. And so, um, you know, it can end up in very difficult situations. But if we know that people in refuges, many women in refuges, have suffered some form of financial abuse as well as other kinds of abuse. So we can't forget that. But I think a big influence is very much in the home. Yeah. And the generations before them and even if parents don't overtly coach their children they still play a role model to their children their children still see or don't see how parents do or don't handle money and take that on board and I think what else needs to happen is that there needs to be better education at schools um, and children going back home and talking about money and how money is dealt with and I, I, I don't think those subjects are really addressed at the moment. 
think that's interesting that it can, it can be a two-way process coming yeah. back the other way. Yeah. And the other thing is there is some research that conducted um, a few years ago that, that showed that in low-income families, actually parents and children did talk about money uh, more. Uh, be, and, and very often children were much more in low-income households were much more aware of what things cost um, and, and the trade-offs that parents had to make in order to manage. So I think that was really interesting, even though they might not have as much pocket money or they might not, you know, there might not be as much money in the family, actually they, they understood more about money. And sometimes that was uh, in, in some sad instances around actually children not asking for things because they know parents can't afford them. So there's, they, they become very sensitised, I think, to their money environment quite quickly. Interesting. Um, any other questions from the floor? Um, over in that corner. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on a point that Marley made about um, education in schools, about money, it's a very valid point. I've got uh, two daughters that attend primary school and often as parents, my, myself and my wife, we talk about money and we talk about at school, is money spoken about? Are you taught about money? Are you taught about the value of money? They're not. My children are 7 and 11, so that there's something missing there. Um, as parents, obviously, we can teach them about the value of money and we try to emphasize to them that um, money is important, money, can, money has power, of course it does, um, but also to make choices uh, to actually pick items that are good quality and, and gonna last rather than gimmicky things and bits of plastic toys that you know are just overpriced and, and gonna fall apart and not last very long and, and to actually teach them about those values is quite important. If you guys are able to influence change in education in any way, I'm sure you must have connections somewhere, I, I, as not just in financial planning sense, but, but also um, in, in the other capacities that you have, I would, as a parent, really welcome that because things do need to change. And the way to, think, to change things for little ones um, is at, at the school. And then obviously they come home, they can talk about money to parents. And I really think that's the way forward because little ones, are like sponges, as we all know. They soak things up and they talk about things and they, they uh, challenge um, things that they're learning and they have debates in classrooms with the teachers and with their peers. It's really, really important, really important value. Yeah, that's a really good point to make. And I don't know if you're aware that at the beginning of June there is My Money Week, but it's really dependent on um, financial experts going into the school. It is for the primary school and they, we, we do it. Um, where we are and um, we probably go to about two schools in that week and um, we, we get them to talk about money we do games about money we show them videos where the children are faced with a dilemma whether they should save their money to go and spend it at Disney World on a family holiday or whether they should buy the latest video game or their friend who's not very well whether they should buy them a present and they have to make the decisions and then we show them the different outcomes and it, 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 you know, the, the resources for that are absolutely great, but it really is a hit and miss. It depends on people picking that up and going into the school. So it doesn't happen automatically in every school in the UK. You just made a valid point there about saving money. Uh, with my children, they want to save their children for their own children to have a good time. And they come home from school, they've turned the TV on, you know, it's got a downtime, and they see an advertisement that's usually like that really bad in the run up to Christmas. Yeah. And they see lots of high value items, 60 pounds, sometimes a lot more, 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. And to them, that's nothing, that's obtainable. And when I, as a dad, I'm saying, no, that's wrong, you shouldn't have that and it's rubbish, and I try to explain why it's a rubbish product or why it's a rubbish toy, whatever reasons I may give. And they go, Daddy, Daddy, it doesn't matter, because in my piggy bank, I've got money, and I'll take it out and spend it, and I go, hold on a moment. The idea of the piggy bank is, yes, you may spend some money on what mummy and I decide are good quality items, obviously in discussion with yourself. We're not saying as a child you can't have any um, influence on what you want to buy, but we also try to emphasize saving, how saving is important, and also try to um, get across to them about the value of money and when is the right time to spend and when is the right time to save. Uh, they're 7 11, they're little, and they don't really get the concept or try, my wife and I try really hard to, to make them understand. Well, well, that's what these videos do. They actually get them to look at when they're... Having games, sorry, sorry, talking yeah. about having games and making it fun. 
that's so important, mm. and I wholeheartedly support that. It's a great initiative because it does sink in and do get the point. Mm. I think the other, um, putting that in context as well, some work that the Money Advice Service did, did uh, a survey of children, young people and their parents, and that, was, that found that um, four in ten of young people aged between seven and 17 had bought something online, um, and half of them had done it unsupervised. Yeah. So it just, I think there's something really important there about, it comes back to your point, it, it's actually much more important to teach children and young people sooner now than it ever has been before because their, their opportunities to spend money um, are much increased and, and much increased to do it unsupervised um, without having the kinds of discussions that you're talking about. So I think there is a, a, ma a massive imperative there uh, because actually the children are spending money and, and possibly getting into habits that we wouldn't want them to get into. Can I just add to that, though, just for the, for on the side of the children, that I'm very keen on education, but then giving children some feeling of independence so that if they are saving, they are saving their pocket money, that then they have a choice on how they're going to spend it. Um, you know, I think the problem is with being a parent is that we always think that our children are going to learn our le the lessons, that, you know, the things that we got wrong or the things that we got right, but I'm very keen on the independence of children so you know teaching them but within that giving them a, a range of possibilities that they can choose from not doing it exactly the same way that we do it um, I, I, I want to give my children as, as much freedom as I can you are quite right it's a very difficult line to walk through yeah. isn't it yeah um, very I, difficult I echo what you're saying. I support yeah that. Sharon I wonder if now is a good juncture to reflect on some of the evidence around children and young people because that seems to be a subject that's resonating We'll come back to more questions after this. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, it just to echo quite a lot of what's been said already, and actually just picking up on um, Marlene's point about learning by experience, we did some work a few years ago looking at the, the financial decision making of young householders. And these are young people who haven't gone to university, they are um, they're, they're making their own way in life uh, from the age of 18 up to 24. And when we surveyed um, and did qualitative research with them, what we found was that actually um, the survey data shows they're much more likely to be in financial difficulty than students. Um, and actually young householders were, seemed to be the group that needed help and support when actually there was so much focus on students. Um, but actually one of the things that came out of the qualitative research with young people, with those young adults, was them saying, well, yeah, but I, I, kind of, I kind of knew something about how I was supposed to manage money, but actually I, the way I learnt was I learnt by mistakes. Mm. And I learnt by the fact that actually I got into debt and I, mm. I had to get out of it again. Mm. So that I think there is something mm. that, I mean, hopefully we would stop them before they got, mm. something would support them before they got into serious debt. But I think there is something mm. there about experience that's mm. really important. Mm. Um, the work, again, talking about the research that the, that the Money Advice Service has been doing, uh, the What Works Fund programme that it's been running, a lot of it has been around children and young people in schools. Um, it is on the curriculum now in the England and Wales, um, although I think there are concerns about how that education is delivered. Um, and there were some really interesting projects in the programme which were about supporting um, teachers and youth practitioners and others who come into contact with children and young people in all different types of environments to actually support their own financial capability. And so it was about empowering and uh, making uh, teachers and youth practitioners and indeed parents feel comfortable about having those conversations and, and being able to pass on that information. So there's quite a lot of evidence now, I think, that some of those initiatives actually do bear fruit. Um, teachers did feel more confident, youth practitioners felt more confident and were able to build that into their work with young people. Um, so I think it is about, um, especially for children and young people, looking at all of the touch points that there are, all of the people they come into contact with and trying to maximise the opportunities for sharing information um, about money management and giving them experiences is also really important. So things like school banks, opening bank accounts at a young age, so I think we, we really know a lot more now about how we might support children and young people to make good decisions. Great. Jen, I was wondering if you had any reflections from an evidence perspective about um, the many studies you've done. I mean, I think that perhaps one of the important messages from many studies is that 
disagreements about money tend to be more heated than almost any other disagreement. And so they actually uh, impact negatively on any opportunity for discussing it calmly. And so one of the critical um, ways in which couples can be helped, perhaps, is to understand how or to be helped to talk and communicate in a more calm way, which allows them to resolve the conflict. And I think it's fascinating that um, if you look at a whole range of research and cross-sectional research, arguments about money tend to be the most heated and the most deadly and the most vicious and, and the ones where actually violence can come in and, and people get really out of control. It tends to be an incredibly emotional subject. And I think it's uh, one, of the one of the learning points, perhaps, in how helping people to deal with that is helping them to understand that emotional content mm -hmm. and to be able to work through that emotional content. And certainly, I think that we know that um, for children in households, that's really pretty devastating. And it's the sort of argument that so easily ends up in people separating and deciding that you know, the whole thing's gone wrong. And uh, so dealing not just with money and debt, but dealing with the way in which people can talk about it becomes actually really critical. Well, added to that is how, what, how money makes us feel and yeah. when we spend money, Absolutely. how that makes Absolutely. us feel. And if yeah. one person's yeah. being deprived yeah. of having that ability yeah. to spend money in the way that they want to, then it yeah. is going to cause mm. a lot of conflict. Yeah. Mm. And reflecting on some of that evidence, do you, what, what do you think is the state of the evidence base for, for the two areas that you look at? Um, and also from what you're hearing today, where there may be an opportunity for crossover between the two areas. I would certainly believe that there is a huge um, benefit in working across sectors, working together. And I think in terms of uh, people with expertise in different areas, mm -hmm. the more they can work together to support families and to help families become stronger and uh, less conflictual is really important. And, you know, money is critical for everybody, whether they've got it or not. And so however advice is being given financially, understanding the dynamic in the family mm -hmm. and helping people to strengthen their relationships has to be the right way forward. But it's the same with many other things. I mean, we've talked about education and the role of education in both terms. We're now uh, having relationship education in schools. Is that going to include financial education? And certainly it's been suggested that maybe everybody coming together in a partnership should have some sort of pack which gives them some information about the kinds of things that they're going to need to understand, talk about, work through, and so on. So, I mean, I think there's many, many ways. We don't, I don't think, have enough evidence in this country of cross-sector working. And it would be really good to do some pilot work and to really understand how, what, what works, what would work for different mm -hmm. kinds of families in different kinds of circumstances. Because we know from lots of other research that you can't just pick off an intervention and that's it, one size doesn't fit all. And so we need to find ways of having a whole variety of tools in the toolkit, if you like. And uh, trying some of those out would be really good. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say there's some really interesting evidence actually about um, uh, using data from Mumsnet yeah. that Liz yeah. Moore from uh, Goldsmiths University mm -hmm. analysed um, lots of uh, conversations on Mumsnet which were specifically related to power and money in relationships um, and what, what she was saying in her research was actually that kind of forum outside the household was really helpful in terms of um, kind of helping women to understand what the norm might be. So th they said that one of the most common questions was around, is this normal? Um, is, you know, what, what should I make of this situation that I'm in? Um, and, and how should I respond to it? And actually um, finding that that was quite empowering for women um, and being and, and actually the, the respondents on Mums Net were sometimes quite critical and saying some of the things that, that were coming from the audience actually that well you should have uh, perhaps thought about these things before that happened or you needed to be communicating better with your partner about this beforehand but actually how some of those kind of new types of inter interventions, the fact that it was anonymous um, and so it, it's like 
we, we have had agony aunt pages, we have had kind of that kind of thing in the past, but actually the fact that this is interactive and can be supportive and it's anonymous actually seemed to be something really positive. Mm. So I thought it was really interesting. And there, there's been similar work actually on forums where people can come and discuss debt um, and what, what that means in terms of um, how they themselves think and feel about money and their own situation. So I think there's something really interesting there about uh, perhaps redressing some power imbalances and, and getting some other types of advice. Yeah. And if, you, if both of you were to choose a priority area for building the evidence base, <coughs> <laughs> I bet you've got a wish, wish list of 400 different projects, but is, is there a priority area, listening to reflecting what you've heard today, or priority evidence? I think one of the, and Jan might disagree with me, but I think one of the areas from, because we have done a lot of research on credit use and debt and accessing debt advice and the process of resolving debt problems, and I think the thing that we don't know a huge amount is, is within families... We know that the, the effects on children can be devastating, but I would like to know more about um, how that plays out as a, as, as a family. How do different partners feel about that situation? How is it resolved? How does it impact on children? Um, because I just remember doing some qualitative research with uh, people in debt, and for one woman that we interviewed, she had uh, got into very serious uh, credit card debt, and she said the moment that it kind of the penny dropped for her was when they, when her son, who was about four at the time, asked, said, "Mummy, can we go to McDonald's?" And she said, "No, I'm really sorry, I don't have enough money." And he said, "Well, that's okay. You can put it on the credit card." <laughs> and she was just like, at that moment, she realised how what was happening within the family and with with the money situation was impacting on her children. And that was the point at which triggered her to really think about getting advice. So I think I would really like to understand a bit more about how that situation impacts how children and young people think about money and feel about money. Mm. No, I think that's a really good idea. And I think the other, the other thing I would say is that we, we know that most people um, who are in relationship difficulty tend to leave it very late before they actually access support. And I don't know whether that's the same in the financial advice sector. It's certainly true of debt advice. Right, and that's exactly. It's really interesting. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, right. so that, and people see, um, you know, counselling as a sort of, you know, it's the last resort. And one yeah. of the things that I think we've been that's trying really very hard to persuade everyone to think about is the preventative work, mm. that you help people with their relationships, you help people work together in families, and that includes children. It's really important not just to ignore children. And trying to encourage access to clear family counselling, not necessarily counselling, but relationship support, education, knowledge, being able to admit that there's a problem and as I said earlier, it's sometimes easier to say there's a problem about money or to run up debts than it is to face some of the really deep personal issues in relationships which are hard to talk about. And June will know very clearly about, you know, people are often at the point of no return when they come for counselling because it's got so desperate. It shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be really encouraging, just like we're talking about better education, for you know, money and so on, we should be encouraging a society where you know, we offer support universally for people in their relationships, in their homes, whatever, so that we don't have the same rate of relationship breakdown, we don't have people in debt ending up getting separated or being in severe poverty because they haven't coped. We need to encourage the use of professionals and advisors much sooner. And I'd like us to find a way of, of doing that uh, more effectively. Great. Wow, a sea of hands. <laughs> um, lady in the middle there, in the blue top. Thanks. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about, uh, given everything about the power dynamics and the emotional labour, um, about what the role of... Uh, sort of debt charities and support agencies who might traditionally have focused on equipping uh, one individual to uh, sort of improve their finances. Um, do you have any thoughts on whether debt charities could be working better with the couple or the whole family? And what you mentioned about forums and things, is there an alternative way that we could be working? I mean, I would love to see some sort of inter-referral system set up where people that went for debt advice, you know, had the option to get, you know, three or six sessions with a relate counsellor 
um, to look at not just how to solve, so, you know, the financial, the debt advice would be about the financial, you know, pay much, this much off every month, whatever, but we'd look at, I, I think someone mentioned earlier about what's caused it, why have they got there, you know, how do they get to that place and how have they handled it, have they hidden it, as, as Jan said, you know, has it been hidden within the relationship? Because if you just solve the, if you just resolve the, the actual practical money situation, which is bad enough, and you don't look at the cause, then it's just going to result, it's just going to, it's like a negative circle, isn't it? We're going to end up back where we started again. Um, and, the, you know, the second time it might be an acting out of the unhappiness within the family coming out in a different way, where there's an affair or, or whatever. Um, so I think I would love to see an inter-referral um, thing where we could, we had the option where, you know, we could maybe apply for grants together with some financial organisation so that we could set up um, referrals so that, that when you guys got, you know, a client that was very emotional and, and you, know, you didn't really know what was going on with the couple that they could come to, you could refer them to relate for three or six sessions and, and likewise we could do the same when we come across a family or a couple that are really struggling with their finances and not communicating properly, that we can then send them to the right place and know that who we're sending people to is the right place. We're not just saying, go out there to any counsellor or go out there to any financial person. We're actually, you know, really like strategic partnerships, really. That's what we need to find, I think. Mm. Any other that? I was just going to say, uh, it's, it's a timely question because this week we're publishing some research that we've done in partnership with the Money Advice Trust. See Lindsay here from the Money Advice Trust and the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, which looked at the experience of frontline debt advisors working with people in vulnerable clients in vulnerable situations. Um, and, and that did ask about um, relationship breakdown and abusive uh, relationships. And what, what a debt advisor, from the debt advisor survey that we carried out, which was 1,600 debt advisors, um, each week about four in 10 debt advisors um, saw a client who was going through um, divorce or separation and each week about 19% of debt advisors said they were seeing a client who was in, uh, in a, an abusive relationship um, and one of the other things that came out from that research was actually sometimes uh, there wasn't the local support networks or the local organisations for debt advisors to refer to so I think there was a bit of a they felt there was a bit of a a, a gap there as well. They really wanted to help people to get support on those issues and other issues because they felt unless that was addressed, then actually the chances of getting to a good debt resolution were um, perhaps adversely impacted. Mm. So I think there is definitely something there. I, I think it's um, what Jean said earlier, um, financial planners can't be counsellors and debt advisors can't be relationship counsellors. So actually having networks um, of support that are out there that touches on what Jan was saying about you know de seeing it as a whole family issue or a whole person issue is really important. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, at the moment, I'm not sure that we've got the infrastructure right to do that. Thank you. Um, I wondered if we could uh, find out what work might have been done at an even earlier stage. I've observed, having had kids who are now adults and a further generation coming on now, it, it always seemed to be amongst my own family and my own siblings and our network of friends that one child will be born and somehow just seems to have some degree of financial competence. You know, they, they know how to save, they know how to what the money box is for. But as soon as that sort of behavioural niche has been filled, the next one comes along and, and tends to go quite to the opposite and has spent their pocket money three times over before they'd had it. And then uh, as the kids grow up, um, sometimes um, these issues resolve themselves a little bit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it goes back to attachment theory or what the, the fundamental causes are. But as they grow up, um, if you have two children who appear to be financially competent and confident um, getting together, those relationships have seemed to work pretty well, at least financially and, and to other 
extent as well. The problem always comes, of course, when you've got two people who are both literally incompetent with their finances uh, and they can't cope and get into all sorts of trouble. So uh, there may be, as you would say, rich scope for a longitudinal examination of um, what might be fundamental underlying causes. Be wonderful in all sorts of areas in, in this sphere. Um, they're expensive and very few people will fund them, sadly. Our experience would be it's really hard to do longitudinal research that's well funded. But you're right. I mean, it, it is interesting to look at generational transmission and how different, you know, we all have individual personalities. So whatever you do within a household, people also bring their own personality to it. And babies are no different. They have their own personality and children do growing up. Um, but um, I think that uh, if we could have more research on how, I think in many ways we know a lot about what goes on in families. There's been a lot of research over the last 20, 30, 40 years. I think what we don't have necessarily is enough research to understand um, the kind of ways in which we can support families and support children and actually intervene earlier, as I was saying just now, intervene earlier in actually helping people where there seems to be some issues. I mean, you know, um, we know that some young people go off track, they get involved in drugs, they get involved in all sorts of things. I think if we could understand more about how we could be a more preventative society, that might be quite useful. And, um, you know, but at the end of the day, we're, you know, I, I won't throw to paper say it all comes down to personalities. And at the end of the day, there's a lot about that, that, you know, you have to kind of accept people, demonstrate their own preferences and approaches and so on. Yeah. But I do think there is a case, as, as we've already touched on, um, about education schools and, you know, we're very keen to do PHSE days in schools um, and teach about healthy relationships and part of that um, would be about discussing things with each other, you know, and learning consequences and allowing each other freedom, but yeah. there's consequences, there's freedom, there's the whole bit in the middle, how you negotiate all that. So I think getting in young, getting to the schools and teaching, not do it this way necessarily, but these are the options, you know, and, you know, this is the sea that you can swim in. And if you go that way, this might happen if you go that. So just bringing the conversations out, really, and as that lady said earlier about, you know, talking to kids early about money and making them responsible for their own money, um, you know, and the whole pocket money thing is, is a great way of doing that and seeing what they do with it, and sit back and observe and hope for the best. But I, I think getting into schools is essential. <laughs> Question, lady in green. Thank you. Um, I think a few panel members have mentioned the importance of preventative work. Um, and in fact, one of you, I'm sorry, I didn't, couldn't remember who, who mentioned it, but. Uh, suggested the idea of giving an info pack to a couple when they get together, perhaps when they get married or make some kind of commitment to be together. Uh, my question would be, what, apart from the question about family origin, what would each panel member put in that info pack in terms of either a question for the couple to discuss or you know, some kind of input that they should learn to equip them to, be, to help them understand the link between finances and relationships and, and a, and a and a healthy relationship? I think I would ask them to talk about, think about their partner and in the ways that they differ. So I would say in the ways of, you know, resolving conflict, discussing things, you know, being secretive, what, you know, what's the advantages and disadvantages, and I would have sort of half a dozen questions but uh, not to talk about themselves, but to talk about their partner and what they know about their partner. Um, just to see and help them explore um, whether, they have, whether they have seriously considered everything that is different in their partner. Um. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah, I would like to uh, get them to uh, talk about, to share with each other how money is important to them, and what it mm -hmm. means to them, what it gives them, what it brings them. What emotional pleasure? Does it give them any sadness, any anger? And just sharing that, I think, would, would go a long way 
uh, to dealing with any sort of financial conflict. I think there's something around what their expectations are of each other exactly. in terms of um, yeah. money and managing money and how, how they would make decisions and um, perhaps coming back to June's point about you know what what strategies have they got in their toolkit and, and uh, you know what do they think works and, and how would that how would that play out in their relationship perhaps? Well, if you look at, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, relationship enrichment, relationship preparation programs around, not so many in this country, but there are some. Uh, there are very many in the United States, and research on those would indicate that it's quite helpful to get people to think about what they are expecting from the relationship mm. because people tend to go into relationships with extremely high expectations of how wonderful it's going to be and it may not always be like that. Mm. How are they going to um, manage with certain issues coming up? What do they think is going to be like if um, giving them sort of ways in which they can begin to think together about some of the challenges that they might face? and money issues and worries, unemployment, housing, mm -hmm. children, all those things that happen to people um, need to be something that people can talk about and think ahead about how they're going to deal with it. One of the um, perhaps uh, most telling pieces of research we did quite some time ago now, but on large samples of people who were separating and divorcing, was that they had not talked about any of these things mm -hmm. before they got together and things had built up and built up, and they'd not talked about them when they happened. And so uh, most of them used things, phrases like, well, you know, I put that on the back burner. I thought I'd deal with it another time. It'll get better. It would improve. And actually, the relationship finally was breaking down because they hadn't addressed those issues. But they hadn't been given any information about the fact they might might actually come up across those difficulties at the moment when they're excited about setting up together as a you know, couple or whatever. And you know, what was telling in that research, it was longitudinal for a change, was that when we went back and talked to these people several years later, something like 60% of them wished they hadn't separated mm -hmm. and wished they'd dealt with the issues that had caused the separation. I found that really quite dramatic, that if they'd been able to address some of the difficulties in their relationships at a much earlier stage, they may not have separated. Because you mentioned, I think somebody mentioned uh, step families and so on. There are all sorts of other issues that come up with money when people separate, repartner, so on and so forth. And uh, I think that you know, the more we could do to at least ensure that people have the opportunity to talk before they decide that a relationship is over, particularly where there are children, that would be quite critical. So I'd want to have information about that. One of the difficulties people often face is that we live in an age with um, a plethora of information. You only have to go on Google and you can get goodness knows how many very helpful advice sites on everything. And one of the responsibilities, I think, of the professions is how to put together really high quality information that's acceptable, understandable, culturally relevant and so on. And that, for me, would be also part of getting together the kind of information people should have. Question. Great answers. Um, lady at the front here. Um, I'm touching on uh, quite a lot of things that have been said, actually, particularly what Jan said about um, women going into refuges and um, suffering from financial abuse. Um, it's it's clear and apparent um, that women get sentenced um, far more severely for far uh, less severe crimes than men, in particular financial crimes such as um, shoplifting, fraud, um, gambling addictions. Um, well, I suppose what I want your thoughts on is do you actually see a future where we can actually prevent women from being sentenced because they're not dangerous these people aren't a danger to society physically just maybe financially could you see like a future where there's going to be any um, alternative form of not sentencing but support for these women I've just been doing some work um, uh, to inform the Welsh Government strategy around supporting people in debt to public services and Wales last week just announced that it was going to stop imprisoning 
people for council tax debt and that was on the back of a case of a terrible case of um, a wrongful imprisonment of a woman in Bridgend. Um, so I think that's a really positive step that um, it affects a minority of people, uh, council tax imprisonment for council tax debt, but it is mainly women. Um, so I think the fact that Wales has decided to stop imprisonment is a really positive step. Um, I think the, the, talking about research gaps, I think the other thing we don't know is what happens to people when they have been through that situation. So when they have been through an enforcement activity, perhaps they have been evicted from their home or they've gone to prison, there is absolutely no information what happens to those people when they, um, what, what happens afterwards. There's not enough out there. I mean, an example, um, I used to be a probation officer as well. I had a woman that went to prison because her husband would give her £20 to go shopping. Then when we looked at what support was available, there is a really big gap when it, there's support up to a certain point and then there seems it seems to be very little information about what support's available to people at that very sharp end when when they're, they're actually at the end of the line. It, it's not entirely clear what support's available. Maybe, any. you know, the judicial system needs to look at itself and say, as an alternative to sending them to prison, we're going to send you on a financial course or... or a yeah. domestic violence um, freedom program style course so they can actually start to recognise the situation that they're in and why they're getting into the point where they're facing prison sentences. Yeah. The problem is that there aren't the resources, aren't there, in terms of you know actual people and also resources so that they <coughs> can carry out rehabilitative or preven preventative work with those people. Well, they would say if incarcerated, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that, that was always ha happening when I left the probation service, that the resources were just getting fewer and fewer and fewer, and that was very many years ago. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I think maybe we've all got a responsibility um, to uh, help people understand the causes of some of these things. I mean, you talk about shoplifting, whatever, getting into debt, the consequences, what, how it is that people get into serious debt, what the consequences are, how they handle it, what they need to be supported. And I think there's a responsibility maybe on you know, all of us in the sort of professional field to make sure that out there different government departments, different systems understand more about what happens in households and families and the kind of difficulties people face. Because we live very often in a blame culture and we don't live in a particularly um, sensitive, understanding uh, culture for people. And the more we can do to perhaps share what we know, share our findings, share our thinking. I mean, you talk about a case in Bridge End. I mean, how can we use these, these examples to actually help people think about these things differently. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. It's it's a whole cross-government, cross-society issue. We're well, probably going to live on the seven pounds a day, so... Mm. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, I was interested in unpicking something that we touched on a bit earlier, but thinking about um, where you've got two people in a relationship that have different approaches to money and the impact that might have on children in a relationship. Um, and just in experiences um, on the front line, I guess, from your experiences of dealing with families where you've seen that kind of thing? I suppose it's, um, you know, we, we have a lot of cases in Relate where people disagree about the parenting of the children. Yeah. So, so, you know, money, the management of money, how much money you should give to children would become part of that. And, and often they've been in relationship for quite a while before they've discovered that they've actually got very different ideas on parenting. Um, so it's about exploring what the differences are and then being able to sort of discuss what is important to each parent um, and then, you know, compromise. Compromise on, you know, if one person feels really strongly that they should, you know, have some freedom within their, how they spend their pocket money and one feels they should be given you know, no money, then, you know, there's this sort of grey area in the middle where where people have to sort of 
comp try and compromise. But it, it is really difficult. I mean, I've definitely worked with couples that have seen parenting as being very different, you know, very different methods and very dependent on, on their own upbringing. And either they want to do it the same as their own upbringing or they want to do it the complete opposite. And it's often when they want to do it complete opposite that the problems start to arise because they're usually trying to defend against a, a background that they feel was unfair or unjust. So difficult. Marlene, have you got any information that from a financial planning perspective? Well, we don't tend to involve the, the children, particularly at, at a young age. Um, so we wouldn't. The only where, the only difference I would see is where they they start to talk about passing on wealth to the children, mm. and you know, one parent will say, "Well, we need to help so and so get on the property ladder." Um, and give them so much and the other parent will say well we have to manage you know so why can't they and I don't think they'll be responsible so you, you have that issue and where we try to help them is, is we, we do this cash flow modeling and say well if you do give X amount of money it's not going to impinge on your lifestyle at all and it's how you want to give that money and get a discussion going about that but that, that, that's mainly where I see um, differences in approach Any reflections on that from the well, I think it's quite useful to do some reality checks with people. Um, if you kind of look at the research about different perspectives from par in partnerships, then there's often one partner who will um, overstate the uh, debts and another partner who will overstate the financial capabilities, and the two may not meet. And uh, it seems to me that one of, the, one of the helpful things to do is some reality check about what's important, what's necessary, because... People don't have to always agree on everything, but they have to agree sufficiently for people to be able to function effectively in you know, a sort of sustainable way. And so having a checklist and doing some reality check can be quite helpful for people. Um, so thinking, something we touched on briefly in terms of it would be great if we could cross-refer and things like that, but um, what do you think policymakers and influencers could do in this space to, to improve the lot for families? Any thoughts? Well, I'm not going to pick on anyone. <laughs> 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 Help to lessen, uh, one thing I would throw in is help to lessen the stigma of help-seeking be it about money, be it about relationship issues, be it about anything else, to, to lessen the stigma around seeking help and make it more acceptable for people to be able to know that they can ask for help and they can get more information and they can get support, whether it's through uh, peer support groups or whatever, but just making it more acceptable uh, to, to do that and to reduce mm -hmm. stigma. There's still a lot of stigma around. Mm -hmm. I think it also comes back to the point that Jan made just a, a moment ago around, um, you know, using what we know, telling yeah. Yeah. what we know yeah. to those policymakers, because I think there can be a certain assumption that if you looked at the official statistics yeah. on household income, you might assume that income within those households is equally distributed, or wealth is equally distributed, mm -hmm. yeah. and power is equally yeah. distributed on a kind of rational economic type of unitary family model. But that's not the case, and we know very well from all of the research that Jan's done that that's not the case. So I think it, it is something about kind of keep saying the same things yes. because that's the only way the messages get across, and, and keep being persistent about not all families are like that. There are these complexities, there are power imbalances, and um, great issues in terms of um, how that plays out within families. And I think emphasising the fact that the the impacts that it can have on children, so the great impacts it can have if it goes well and the terrible impacts it can have if it goes badly, um, and, and thinking how that affects our, our upcoming generations is a really important point. I think attaching greater priority to financial education in schools, making it compulsory uh, part of the curriculum rather than a choice um, as it is now, um, would, is something I, I would like to see. Um, I would like to see um, prevent more, more preventative work because at Relay, unfortunately, people do come along sometimes when it's too late. So 
would like to do more work in schools and working with people when they're thinking of you know living together um, to work to how to make the best of their relationship and to to learn about how to build a healthy relationship um, rather than us waiting until disaster hits and you know someone's gone into debt or there's been an affair or whatever and then we're, we're, we're working I mean we do work very well um, with relationships and 80% of people say that their relationship is strengthened from you know after six sessions would relate so but we'd you know we could do so much more work if we could work preventatively mm. um, so to change government policy and and to to get in um, to be able to offer the services to people who can't afford to pay as well it's another big factor for us mm. is we would love to be able to offer people who, who um, and, and that funding for us at the moment is limited as to those free places I'll take one more question I think from the floor and then we'll ask the panellists for their final reflections oh there's, there's two very eager questions okay I'll take two I'll take the one at the front here and the, the lady at the back so I'll come to you whichever way yeah. poor David's running up and down uh, the gentleman here it wasn't really a question, it's just a statement on, on what you've just said, um, you know, regarding help and advice and stigma and so forth. And I wonder if you can actually go one step further back, and that is that the industry, the financial service industry, takes a more responsible role. Um, and what I mean by that is that at the moment, the products one can buy are pretty much off the shelf. They're one size fits all. And so I wondered if the industry itself can be a little bit more responsible in rather than marketing all things to all, um, and you know, approving products and so forth, that they could be a little bit more inventive and perhaps collaborate with you guys and the money advice service and you know people like my bank and so forth, and design products that are suitable for the intended target rather than for all. Well, I think that's where communication is more important than just financial advice, where solutions are provided and a product isn't necessarily bought at all. Hello? Is this working? Oh. Um, I wanted to know where you think that the work that you're doing potentially fits in with the um, launch of last week's parental conflict um, program um, launched by the DWP, which identifies finance and debt as one of the main criteria that causes parental conflict and also has... Um, uh, grants in place nationally for local authorities that want to apply to deal with that issue and as part of that would be looking at the things you're talking about um, and asking local authorities to um, use a pot of money to go out and look for services like your own um, that can um, help to um, help with parental conflict through these issues like um, debt being one of them, finances being one of them. Um, because there's been a lot of research. You've talked a lot about early intervention, stuff like that. Well, there's been a lot of research that they've done around that and they've done two phases of um, taking out to local authorities to try different things and intervention. So there's a lot of work there. It's done in collaboration with the Early Intervention Foundation. I uh, just wondered what or if you're doing with regard to that. Anything? Relate do work with the department, uh, the DWP, and we do have different programmes around pa um, parental conflict going on around the country, and we are looking to do to increase that amount of work substantially going forward. And you know we are the the obvious place to go for that because. Our, you know, our speciality is relationships. So, you know, like I said earlier, why wait until it's in a state of conflict? Let's, you know, let's try and work with it from the beginning all the way through and reduce those end cases. Because there's something like two million distressed families in... 2.8 million, thank you. Distressed families in the UK at the moment. Um, you know, and we could work with them if we had the funding. So it's just about you know, getting the funding to, to increase, to, to make use. We have the counsellors, we have the expertise, we're ready and waiting to do it. Jan? I, mean, I, think, well, I think we always welcome anything that government is going to do to support families in various ways. I think one of the um, 
One of the complexities about the current DWP program, perhaps a twofold, is one that they're really focusing on parenting interventions. And my worry would be that they neglect the fact that you can't just work on parenting, you need to look at the whole dynamic between parents. And so um, it's kind of quite a narrow base on certain parenting interventions, primarily um, ones that have been tested in other countries. And the fact that it's also based on workless households. And we know that a lot of the people who are in distressed relationships and are in <coughs> debt are not in workless households, they're in working households. And so that the current initiative is dealing with a very specifically uh, quite small area of families. No, it's, it's, it's providing funding for different levels. Yeah. Regardless of whether they're workers or not, yes, that's okay. one of the areas that we will look at to see if it's there. But it's, it's not limited to workers. Okay, well that's music to my ears because certainly, yeah. as I read it in the beginning, it was about workless yeah. households no, and it's up, yeah. It's up to the local authority. Yeah. Um, they will be given a pot of money. Right. And they have to buy and purchase. Yeah. This is the only issue I have. With yeah. It. The, the resource from them, the training resource. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. within that, we can pick like different levels and tiers of training for our staff and partnership agencies. So that would be other services, including commission services, um, to go and do that training. And then once they have that knowledge and understanding those different levels of intervention and um, expertise in implementing strategies, then they can go out and work with who they want. And they would be look. It's not you have to work with okay. workers' families because I work in the early health okay. service, and we wouldn't do that. We right. Say we're not going to do that because you're not workers. So. And you, and you're in one of the pilot areas, are you? The pilots have stopped now. The the, the program nationally launched last week. Oh, so we're, we're probably talking across purposes then, because I was looking specifically at the workless families initiative. So. No, it's yeah. part of that. It's part of that. What okay. It, what it's saying is we. What they're saying is. Yeah. In those families, you will see these issues, right. you will see debt, and you will see credit right. conflict. But they're not saying you can't work with other families. Well, that's great. So I hope that I hope that you will then be able to work with the relationship support sector and the advice agency yeah, sector, because well, well, that would be really helpful if we could do some joining up and test it. We're more than asking workers in the issues you're talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, well. no matter where that money comes from, the better. Good news. Great. Um, could I have one very succinct line from each of the panellists to finish? And what I wanted you to take away was, what's the one thing that has surprised you or you've learnt from someone else sitting on the panel from their respective mm -hmm. sectors? So you're a bit on the spot. I'll, I'll buy the time by, by giving you one myself so you can have a second to think about it. So mine was... Um, we talk so much in the debt sector about people leaving it late, too late. So they, they, they move down the spiral of debt and they, they seek advice when they're very far down the spiral and where things are really difficult. And I'd never really thought about that from a relationship perspective. So that was my interesting thought and, and the learning from your sector. Um, the thing I've learned is listening to Marlene, I'm delighted that she has you know the financial background and is working with people and taking into account all their, the emotional aspects of them as well. Um, and I, that's music to my ears mm. that you know that there is that sort of joint focus when you're working with people that you're not just thinking about the numbers you're thinking about the, the emotions mm. and the people in the room as well I wouldn't say that that was across the board for no. financial advisors no. and planners though No, uh, I'm, I'm not denigrating them in any way it's just that they're not equipped with those skills when they go into financial services they're equipped to dealing with finance <coughs> and numbers so you know I'm one of the few in an unusual position to be able to do that. But I think, you know, it's changing. Um, they are recognising that personal soft skills are needed and the ability to be able to communicate with couples or individuals on the emotional issues of dealing with money is becoming more important. What was your one thing, Molly, while you've got the floor? I'm not sure if I've learned anything new, really, you know. I'm, I'm a because of my background in both fields, I'm aware that um, all sorts of matters cause conflict and that couples don't seek help until it's too late. And often, um, as June will know, when you're dealing with couples, they're in conflict. 
and you're, you know, I'm, I have the advantages that most of the time I'm dealing with couples who are not in conflict, who have enjoyed an apparently happy and harmonious relationship for very many years and have dealt with their finances and are coming to me to help progress that throughout their retirement years. Um, so it, it's, it's very different, really. I think you stole my own one, Sarah, because uh, I was thinking also uh, it makes complete sense that, that people it's not just debt, but actually that issue about people leaving things too late. And actually it's the accumulative effect of all of those things that probably um, lead to the breakdown of finances and the breakdown of relationships. But I think the other thing, which it just reinforced for me from what Jan was saying, the importance of communication, because if you're as a couple you're good at communicating within your relationship and you communicate about money then you have a strong relationship mm -hmm. and your chances of weathering financial storms Absolutely. are increased mm -hmm. so i think that's and that's, that's backed up by research yeah, very yeah, clearly yeah, that people yeah. who can manage their issues work together harmoniously are much more likely to be able to resolve quite serious financial issues yeah. when they're them. so yeah. yeah there's a mutual support there yeah. which for other, other couples is lacking I think I was just interested to learn about your bridge end case and the fact that Wales is doing something quite exciting about not sending women to prison yeah. um, particularly when their crimes have been re debt related and so yeah. on so that is really very positive but I think for me the whole thing is just how much our work practitioner wise and research wise is so interrelated and how it, it supports each other. So for me, this is the beginning of a, a journey of cross-sector support and, mm -hmm. and working together, and I think that's really exciting. And that is a lovely way to end. <laughs> so um, we have the room until nine, and apparently there is more wine. So for those of you that are still standing and eyes wide open, <laughs> do stay and, and continue conversations over wine. But before we close, can we give our panellists a very big round of applause for this? for David who put the event yes. together as well. Yes.